Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good early morning, depending on where you are. I'm talking to you, Melissa. <laughs> this is Revit Radio. This is a show where, for those of you who look like I see a few new people, um, if you ask questions, we will... Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. There we go. Oops, god dang it. Try to turn it on and I end up screwing something on my screen. So you ask the questions, we answer them for you. So with that said, thank you for somebody telling me that the Q&A is turned off. If you are going to ask some questions, please put those questions in the question and answer pod. As people, you know, type to us and give us crap, those questions float to the top and it's really hard to keep track of them if your questions are actually put into the um, Q&A pod. But with that said, I'm Brian. That is Melissa, depending on where she's sitting in your world. And the other, other person here is Desiree. <clears throat> We're here to, you know, take an hour of your billable time and hopefully make it a little bit, little bit fun for you. So as usual, as we're going and we're getting started, I always like to um, jump in. Am I sharing my screen? I am sharing my screen. I always like to jump in and show a little bit of something um, to talk about as we get in there. And the thing that I know I use a ton of, I know Melissa uses a ton of, Desiree uses a ton of, yet is never taught in any like Revit 101 class, and that is filters. Right. So I don't know. To me, filters are one of the most powerful underused tools. Um, when I go to firms, I don't, I don't know if you guys see this a lot, Melissa, when you go there too. I go to firms, like I see all this right click, hide and view crap and thousands of views and people doing things like, why don't you just use a filter to do this or a filter to do that or a filter to do whatever? Um, I even thought it was so underrated that in the sample structure project for Revit 24, which is also the same sample file for Revit 25. I attempted to put some filters in here just so people could kind of start to see, look, you can color code things based off of data. So if you really wanted to see what was going on, if you go into Revit 25 you can, and you go to the 3D structure only view in the structure sample file, um, you can see I was the person that generated this model. I do have a lot of different color coding going on here. It's not because I like the rainbow of colors. It was literally because as I was modeling, I kept confusing myself what was going on with this project. Um, one of the things I showed inside of here is you can see I have some levels that are color versus some that are art. There is a filter that's doing that, right? So if we actually look at some of these levels, I have building story checked on some of these. The other ones I don't have building story checked. I have structural checked, right? So we've got different values inside of there. So if I go into my visibility graphics for this 3D view and I go to filters, you can see that I have a lot of different filters that were built inside of here. So one of the filters are, hey, I want all of the MEP stuff to turn red. Well, most of the stuff in Revit MEP, when we start looking at that, it's going to have a system classification. And for those not in the MEP world, we don't really care about the cyan pipes and the red pipes and the green pipes and the purple pipes and all that stuff. We want to see your stuff as one color. So I do have something you're saying, cool, I've got all the MEP system stuff and I can go ahead and turn that on. So when I have that MEP link turned on, I can go ahead and turn it red, et cetera. I also go through and do the same thing for a lot of different other things, but where I was getting at with the levels, as you can actually see, I have a filter in here for levels that are building versus levels that are structural. And what we do with these filters is we create the filter, which I'll show in just a minute, and then we can come back inside of here and say, cool, in our visibility graphics, how are we going to use that filler filter? Are we going to turn something off? Are we going to change the line weight or the color? Are we going to make something transparent? What are we going to do with this filter to the, to, of those objects? So it's not like a filter changes the colors. It's how we utilize the filter inside of there. So when we start looking at filters in general, if I go to the View tab and I go up to Filters, we can start to see these are the filters that are, again, in this Revit structure sample project. And yes, Simon did say, um, for those of you using Revit LT, you do not have the capability to um, use filters. So that does stink for people in the... Um, Revit LT world, although I've had like a few clients in my life start with Revit LT and was, yeah, no, I just need to upgrade to the full-blown version. But in here, when we come down here, start looking at the one I said, just, hey, I'm looking at levels that are building versus levels that are structural, right? One thing I always try to tell people is, A, come up with a good naming convention on your filters. I was in a client's office and literally there were nine filters doing the exact same thing, but somebody just renamed them differently. Somebody called it like, hey, this filter is going to be, you know, like, brick wall the other one said wall brick or whatever you know whatever they were doing inside of there so i have in my mind a very specific thing what categories am i changing and then with a dash what value am i looking at 
So if we come down here to what we were just looking at, my levels, <clears throat> excuse me, my levels that say building, right? I'm gonna come into, rev into filter category and I can say create new. Then in the middle here, you're gonna check what categories in Revit you're gonna use. And then once you do that, what properties are you looking at? Cool, I'm looking for the level, if it has a building story, equal to yes, right? The other one was down here saying, cool, I wanna look at levels that were set up to be structural. Same thing, levels is a structural value equal to yes, right? So a filter is a query into the database. The question becomes then, how do we use that filter or that query to the database? Again, that's where you go back to your visibility graphics, or in most cases, you're going to do it in a view template. How are you going to start looking at stuff like that, right? So that's how the levels got color coded. I also was getting confused in my structural modeling here because we start looking at this, right? This project used K-series joists. So the beams on this side need to drop down the seat depth. The beams on this side obviously need to be lined up with the top. So I was going through and trying to move all the beams down that two and a half or five inches, depending on the, on the K-series joists. And I was like getting confused. Did I do it? Did I not do it? Did I miss one? Did I not miss one? So literally I created two different filters in here. One for if it's, it's Z value, I'll go look at this. If it's, um, if it's Z value is going to be not zero. And one of them is like if the Z value is greater than two feet. So again, how that was done, if I come back to filters and I go down to my structural framing, right? I can see cool is structural framing. It has a Z offset value that doesn't equal zero. So if it's been leveled up at all, I want to be able to select that, right? So if it's not flat, it's off the level. I want to be able to select it. Then I had another one called Z offset less than six inches. So I start coming here looking at, okay, these are kind of similar, but a little bit different. And the reason why I wanted to know that, and the reason why I chose six inches is somewhere on here, we have a heavy, heavier joist where it's not just the two and a half inch seat depth. One of them has like a five inch. So I wanted to know if I lowered the ones for the two and a half and five versus one of the ones that are just completely dropping because this has like a drop level inside of here that was going to be greater than that. So again, in this view, I went into the filters and you're going to see I have both of those inside of here. So I've got the Z offset less, less than six and the Z offset inside of here. Now, the one thing I do like to point out about this is the order these are inside of here matter. I had a client who we have filter set up to. One of the guys was OCD and he actually sorted all these alphabetically. <laughs> and then he came back and said, um, half the filters are broken. Why are my filters broken? So the one that I have in this, right? This one basically says, is there a Z offset? So anything that doesn't equal um, zero. This one said, is that Z offset less than six? If I literally just take this one up and hit the okay button, what you're going to see, and then probably, oh, I should have done it. Why did it not change? It should have actually just moved this one. What is the properties of that one? The Z offset is negative two foot four. Oh, it's because I have it greater than. So this is a negative value. So it's not actually seeing that. But um, no, I should say, didn't I say doesn't equal? We'll go back and look. But what I was going to say inside of there, and I really thought this was going to change that, is in those filters, um, depending on which way you move these is how that color is going to look. So if I move one up versus one down, if it finds the rule and that rule is going to change a thing, it's done. It won't allow a rule after it to change or adjust that effect. You can take advantage of this in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases, I'm like, cool, I want to change the cut lines of something with this filter. And then I want to change the fill pattern of something with this other filter. So you can break it down into multiple filters if you need to but the direction, the order that these filters are set up inside of here can absolutely make a difference when you start looking at this and seeing what's going on. I really was expecting these ones all to be the same color. So I don't know what I broke on that, but there's something not working in here. But these are those things that I also try to get people to start saying, you know, filters aren't necessarily something you're necessarily need for, you know, printing of your project or whatever. As you can see in that scenario, that was for me to keep my brain wrapped around something. <clears throat> In this scenario here, this is a project that had a raised floor system. The raised floor system was going to be going under like interior walls, but some of those walls need to go down to that structural level. So I created a filter um, that basically said, hey, if I've got doors or generic models or walls at level RF, let's go ahead and use that. So if I come down here and look at my doors and walls level one or level RF, you can see inside of here, I've said, cool, I want doors. I probably added generic models to this, so I should rename this. <clears throat> and walls. 
And in this case, doors have a level, but walls have a base constraint. So I can't just do a one filter for this. Well, this is one filter, but I can't just do a an and filter for this. I can't just say, hey, select everything that's at level one because some things have schedule level, some things might have reference level, some things might have base constraint, et cetera. So inside of here, I changed this filter to be an or filter. And that way I could say, hey, if the door is equal level one or the wall's base constraint equals level one or the generic model's level equals level one, and you can just keep adding to this as you add different categories. If you're like, man, I'm looking for specialty equipment. Cool, I can come down and be like, let me go add the specialty equipment inside of here. Let me say, okay, oops, not okay. I needed to change the filter. Hey, do I do that? Come on, rabbit. I don't know what that dialog box is telling me, but cool. So now I've got my specialty equipment. Let me try that again. Yes, I know that specialty equipment is there. So now I can add a new rule come down here to my specialty equipment, and then I could be like, cool, do they have reference level, they have elevation from level? What are we looking for on this one? Again, depending on your property, some of them have like reference level, depending on what that category might be. And then in filters, as you're getting inside of here, um, it could be, what are the rules? It depends on which thing you choose. If you choose like a level value or a dimension value or a text value, you're gonna get contains, does not contain. So a lot of these can be different as you're looking into it. So again, I can come up here and say, cool, level one RF, and now any of these types of things that are associated to the level one RF, that search or that Revit filter is going to select, All right? Then in my visibility graphics, I just came down here in this case, said, cool, I'm gonna go ahead and take anything that's got the level RF, and I'm gonna take those projection lines and those cut lines, and I'm just gonna change the color to be green. That's all I've done. So now inside of my working view, I can see the green walls versus the black walls. I can make sure the doors are there, right? I can make sure that somebody didn't come down here like, no, 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 this was this door. We should have just been on that level one structure. And therefore, if I'm actually cutting a section through the building, you know, now there's going to be this door six inches or whatever that raised floor system is buried into it. I have used this on a lot of projects that have split levels and you're looking at it in one floor. Let me start changing the color of those types of objects to see it. So definitely something that becomes beneficial. You can add it to your working views. Um, you know, you could add it to your 3D views. You could put this on your printing set, although I don't think you'd really want green walls on your printing set, but you have the capability to go through and start really setting that information up and, and going through and setting it up. And again, like I said, the other thing I really love about filters is they do go through linked files. So I can start changing things in linked files. The biggest filter that I've probably been using for the longest time is one of my filters is one called levels and grids or grids and levels. Depends on what, you know, what my mood was that day. Levels and grids that don't equal my client's name. So for all of my clients, when I'm setting up their template, I always make sure on the levels and grids to put their acronym at the beginning or something at the beginning and whatever you want. Because then what I do is I go create a filter and that filter just goes in and says, cool, if it doesn't begin with the client's acronym, that's my filter. Then I can just choose to untick this. And I don't have to rely on the consultants to put their damn levels and grids on the appropriate work set. Because we all know we screw that up, right? So now I can start coming through here to saying, cool, this is really all I want to do to this. I just really want to be able to untick this. And the other reason why I like this, I don't have to go to the whole manage work sets turn the work set on, turn the work set off to keep comparing their levels and grids. I can just in one of my views, disable that filter. There's no links inside this file, so that's not gonna do anything, but I can just disable that filter. Now I can see all of those consultant model levels and grids. And again, doesn't matter what work set they're on. So I am not a big proponent of trying to rely on consultants work sets because um, people screw that up quite often. And then there's always the worry that they've modeled the whole day on the levels and grids work set and you turn it off and see nothing. Yeah, you see none of the models, et cetera. Yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that. So I don't know, how else do you guys, I know you guys use filters a lot, Melissa. What are some other things that I might be missing that you use them for? Um, we have a lot of families and things brought in with what Aaron calls the includes parameters. So you can basically say, um, say the, uh, well, sorry, 5 a.m. brain. <laughs> On the the concrete plans, we have a filter. And Beth, oh, yes, sorry. And Beth says and requires parameters. So. 
Beth probably knows the one I'm trying to talk about. <laughs> but the uh, the concrete plans, we have a checkbox, so you, know, you could set it out and only have, you know, maybe plumbing show up so that when you're doing your concrete yeah. plans. Uh, so it's kind of like doing one of the selection filters plus. Yeah, I also, um, I know you guys do very similar. For me, whenever I'm doing clearances, like if the clearance is a, a part of a door family or a mechanical family or whatever type of family, for me, those are always nested families into whatever family it's going to be. So it's a generic model that's nested into the door, generic model that's nested into my mechanical equipment, et cetera, whatever it might be. It's a generic model that's nested and clearance is in the name. So then I can have a filter says generic models contains family name contains or begins with or whatever clearance. And then I can untick that in a view and all the clearances turn off, but none of my actual stuff turns off as well. And again, I can pass that filter onto my consultants when they're like, why am I seeing all your stupid handicap ADA clearances and all of the clearances around your doors and your drinking fountains? I don't care, right? All of those types of things. It's a filter that goes through and sets that up. So that's the other thing that I always try to tell people too. When I have specific filters for like, I use filters for rated walls. I use filters for rated doors to color code those. I literally have a Revit project that has those filters and like two view templates using those filters inside of it. So then for, I can just send that to all of my consultants. They can transfer project standards. And now they have all those filters along with a couple of view templates of how we're making them look for us. So we're saying take this code wall, wall and make it purple. You're going to see the same purple. We're going to say make it dashed or whatever. You're going to see that same information. So for me, I have a specific Revit project that only has the filters in it the, and a couple of view templates so that my clients can just transfer project standards and get that because they do not want to go in and transfer project standards from my actual project because, you know, they're going to get 500 filters and be going, I don't know which ones I need to use. This is crazy. So I try to make their lives easy on filters. I think they will need. <laughs> so it's one of those things, once you start using them, you're like, oh my God, how does anybody work without them? You know, it's funny. I, I literally just set this up for this project. So I knew this project hacked and I started realizing, oh, if this wall goes to the ground and this actually doesn't have a raised floor system inside of here, huh, I screwed all these walls up. And yes, I did the modeling on this project. I'm like, I screwed all these walls up. These should have been going all the way down to that shark room. So literally just looking at my own modeling, but man, I suck just because I added these filters, which I should have probably had on when I was actually modeling these. So always one of those things, you know, spend some time, learn filters, get to understand them. The other big thing I do like to say about filters, and this cracks me up about Revit, is everybody comes down and uses light bulb tool. Well, why can't I see X, right? If I go back to VG and I take that same filter, I'm just going to turn off the visibility of all those walls. People are like, well, I don't see all these walls. I know there's walls, well, not those ones. I don't see all the walls. Where are they? The light bulb tool isn't showing me why they're gone. The light bulb tool literally only displays two of the 60 reasons why Revit turns something off. <laughs> Things it shows is right click, hide in view, element, or category. That is it. That is the only two things the light bulb shows. So if you turn it off via uh, element, or a category, it does not show filters, it does not show um, phasing, it does not show any of those other reasons and why something might be turned off. It's literally just those two. So if you are getting into filters and using filters quite often to, to change the display of things, you gotta, under, you gotta educate your teams, et cetera, and understand, hey, this is what we're doing for those filters. There's over 30, 40, no, it's actually up over 60 reasons of why things aren't being displayed depending on what you're looking at and what elements, but there's over 60 different something or other why something could be turned off. And then just as the best fun joke, just go up to somebody where it says display model and just say, hey, turn it off. Go to somebody's working view and just say, do not display. Then the entire model disappears. Like, why do I just not see anything but grids and text? This is horrible. That's just, you know, if you're really don't let that. you out in public, right? <laughs> <laughs> So that's kind of one of those uh, big things for me. That's what I wanted to get started with. So like we have some questions now. So we'll let Melissa cover some of those questions. And Craig has a perfect question for this. So he's asking about filters. <clears throat> Sorry. What tool or method do you use to copy a filter with overrides to another template and or project? So you did touch on that a little bit. Mm -hmm. So 
that is one thing that does suck with out of the box Revit. If you're like, cool, I set up all these filters, right? I love what I've got in my working view here. I've set up all these filters or in my template. I love this. This is great. Now I want to transfer that over to the actual view template or a different view. You can't do that out of the box. So there's a couple of tools that I have. One of those, and I literally just abled all my, hopefully I turn them all back on. Um, one of the tools, DI Roots has one, it's called the, do, 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 the one filter. And the one filter here is theoretically going to start coming through here and showing you, hey, I've got filters in this view. I can start coming across to, where is it? Filters, yep, full model, active view. I can start looking at, hey, here's the filters we've got inside of here. I forget. Um, whole model, where am I looking for? Filter values by, I know it's in here somewhere. <laughs> Is it not one filter? No, it's not one filter. I'm lying. We're talking filters. It's not that. It's under the view tool. I think it's under the view manager. I'm like, why am I not seeing this? Yeah. And then there's view templates here. So you can be like, cool. I've got this 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 filter here. I've got that one, right? I, I, that's the one I want to select. And I want to transfer it. Do, 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 do. Template transfer. Wrong tab. So over here, I'm gonna come down, like, I've got this code plan. I wanna go ahead and take this code plan and transfer it, right? So I've got this one. I wanna go ahead and take all of the different phase filters, no, the view filters, VG override filters, and I wanna transfer those into, which template do I wanna go to? Well, not the same template I'm in. I wanted to go to like, let's just say my, my working template, cool. Since it was done successfully, and I probably should have showed this first, but I should be able to undo. The problem I have found with the DI Roots tool is if I go back into my view templates, manage, view templates, no, view, view templates. I always go to manage for view templates. I do not know why. Manage view templates, and I go back down to that one I chose. Cool, all of those should have come across when I go into the filters. What I have found is it will overwrite something you possibly had. So if I had like four or five temp filters in there, or maybe I already had the ones in here, I have found that it just overwrites. It doesn't add in addition to. Um, I did this on one client. I told them download it. They added it across the board. They would do a print a couple of days later and realized all of their code plans were broke because it deleted everything they had in there and, and brought it across. So do be aware of that. If you're putting it into a blank template, it works great. I personally use, and now I've got to find this tool because I don't use it that often. I don't even know if I have it added inside of here. Yeah, view filter manager. So this is the tool I use. I'm pretty sure this is the same tool Parallax uses. This was like a hundred dollar tool, so it's not free, um, but inexpensive for what you want. But you can see this gets to a whole nother level of cool. I can start coming through, through to find what, what views am I looking for or view templates do I want to look for? How do I want to put those across? And if I do come through and grab one, which ones do I want to be doing across? Maybe I don't want to grab all of them. Maybe I only wanted to grab these ones inside of here. You can start grabbing what you want and then the destination filter as well. So a lot of different ways to do this um, works works really well. Um, yeah, and Tom's saying he thinks the EF tools for PyRevit has a version of this as well. I have not used that one, but yeah, so not just PyRevit, but the EF extensions for PyRevit, um, I think has something like that too, but I have not personally used that one. I have this tool. It's amazing. You can also say, hey, cool, now you've done all of those, add it to these six new templates. So you'd be like, cool, I wanted to add that to this one and this one and this one and this one and this one. And it's not a one-off thing. So the only thing I did find with an issue on this one, I don't know if they fixed it because I know there was a new version somewhat recently, is it used to be that it wouldn't override the enable or disable filter. So if you had the filter in there, but you had it disabled, I don't think it would untick that on all the view templates. Correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa, I haven't used it in a while. Yeah. I think that in enable disable was not part of the cool. You brought the filters across, but. Yeah, I think that was a, was a portion. Yeah, if you're if you're a firm that uses view templates okay, and you're that that uses filters, the hundred dollars you spend for this tool, buy a few licenses for the office, it's it's so worth the cost. Absolutely. It's <laughs> definitely, definitely one of our favorite tools when working on template things. Yeah, about the same idea of overrides on, it doesn't work in there. I knew there was something in that idea. I was like, oh, I didn't pick up on that. But even just transferring and adding the 500 
the filters or tools, it works really well. Yes. And yeah, every time, because we do actually have, say, the clearances, we have slightly different versions. So we do have door clearances and appliance clearances, and case work clearances, just in case, because we've had people that need a combo of, you know, show yeah. show the the casework, but don't show the doors and things like that. So every time we add clearances to a new thing, we have to go push those through to like the 5 million view templates. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm just looking at the questions. So yeah, so the view filter manager is my favorite for moving them across. And then I guess, Brian, you already touched on the moving them to other files, by putting them into kind of a a dummy file or a really paired Yeah, so like, for, like for me, for my one clients, once we get all set up, I literally took their template, um, created, started a new project from their template, went in and deleted all the view templates out, but like those two or three that we needed. And then I personally use the ID8 tool and say, cool, now we only have it in two or three view templates and we've deleted all the views. Now I could go into, I used ID8 style manager to say, okay, which filters are even actually being used now? And then I could just delete those out. So I did it. That's how I did it. And yeah, I got to go through and do that every once in a while when I do it. But again, it's to me, I am a big proponent of create a file that people can just open and transfer project standards are if you need to push data across. I do the same thing for all the properties. Like, so for this particular client, um, all the properties on a sheet, they've got like 35 properties that they need people to have on a sheet. Those are all grouped under overall legend for them. And they literally have a file that just has all this stuff in the overall legend, actual drawing indexes. I covered this in a previous radio. And then that saved into a file. So everybody can just open up that file, copy the schedule or transfer project standards. So make the other people's lives easy when you are going through and creating some of this stuff for them to take effect of it. Um, Julian asks, is the EF tools free? Yeah, EF tools are free, but you have to have PyRev at first. So obviously nothing's going to be working with 25 quite yet. Oh, it looks like Rick has a filter follow-up too. Yes, perfect. So Rick is asking if you have started to use and recommend filters that check the phase rather than using phase filtering in order to be able to show future stuff more simply. I absolutely have been starting to take that in consideration. So, um, what was it, right? 23, 22? I don't remember. Um, one of those started coming in and getting into, we had the capability, because before when we were using phasing, the only way to change the graphics of an element in phasing was to literally go to phases, play with the graphics override, and then apply that graphics override. Biggest downside to this is there was no way to ever show future stuff different than the rest of the file. So we couldn't go in and say, cool, we, we want to come in and you show the future stuff. And whatever version of Revit was, I forget now, it's been quite a few years. We have the capability now under filters to start setting up those filters based off phase created, demolished, etc. So you can see in kind of in start, start up, up here, I have this is my little template for doing this. Again, I use this to transfer project standards. I can go in and say, cool, I want to grab all these different categories because it is not every category of Revit, right? If I were to say, go ahead, callouts, it's going to break this filter because callouts do not exist. They don't have a phase filter to them, right? So it's like, cool, if I said yes, it's going to break this. But you have the capability to come into these, come into any of these and start saying, cool, I want to create something that was selected, created in phase one but demolished in phase two. So you can start going through here and building. You can use multiples if you wanted to. You could be like, hey, I'm just looking for anything demolished in phase two. So you again, layering those level of, of filters into a view you can do. I've just set this up this way to start getting the introduction to clients. But yes, I have a current client where we're doing phasing plans for actual construction. They're doing a giant project and there's two contractors on the project at the same time, working within each other, working at the same time, just in different sides of the building, but they're designing it all as one. They've got to do that. So they've started to go in and added phases for contractor phases, not really construction phase or not really, you know, building phases. And we are going through like, cool, we can show the phase for that contractor pink while we're showing the phase for this contractor normal or inverse that, et cetera. So we're really starting to go through and massively take advantage of, of this when you start looking at it. So yeah, we've been getting into it. But one of the greatest things is 
uh, and the way this works is if I just come in here and draw a couple walls, all right, here's a wall, here's a wall, here's a wall. So if I come in here, I could be like, cool, this wall was going to be created in phase two, this wall was going to be created in phase three, and this wall was going to be created in phase four. With normal phase filtering, I'm in phase two. I cannot see that stuff with a phase filter. I could go in and say no filter, and I would see it, but I can't see that stuff with a phase filter. But since I have that stuff, I could go in, create a filter, um, anything created after phase two, et cetera. But I'm going to come in here and just go, cool, I'm going to go grab my filter. I'm going to add a filter. I'm going to say stuff created in phase three as well as phase four. Man, my uh, she is having issues with graphics. Maybe I should have restarted my Revit before I did this. Cool. So created phase three and phase four. Sweet. I'm just going to half tone those for ease of use. So that could be future phase, right? So even though I'm in phase two, I could turn those lines to be dash or whatever, and I could say these are my future phases. So we have a lot more flexibility in going in and doing what we want to do. We just have to make sure that our phase filter is set to none for things like, hey, I want to show those things, um, future things, et cetera. So yeah, I have been recommending people start using this um, depending on what their project is doing. It does add another level of complexity because most people are used to like them down here. This is no phase filter, but all these things are color coded different based off of the phase. So it is adding that level of complexity. But once you get those view templates set up, it's, it's working pretty well. So on that one of the multiple contractors, are you literally still calling it just phase two or are you calling it contractor A phase two? Just they've got something like that. It's like they've got like phase two and then the sub phases for each contractor is 2.1, 2.3. They don't want to get contractor specific because honest truth is like the ninth time the phasing has changed on this project. And it's just like, oh my God, because <laughs> the, the client keeps changing what they're doing. What? That never happens. Yeah. What a weird, what a weird project you have. <laughs> it's like, it's originally just here's the existing stuff. Here's the remodel new stuff. And then I was like, oh, we got to break that down into four phases. Now it's broken mm -hmm. down to like nine phases or something stupid. It's like, oh my God. But of course, it's, it's, it's a public space that people need to keep getting through. So they can't just close the whole building and do it. So there's got to be a whole lot of routing of things. Okay. That's our last filter question. All right, should we look at Michael's? So he's asking about project information dashboards. So do you do warnings, family size, family count? What do you want to see user facing versus file maintenance facing? Same things? I don't do a whole lot on the project dashboard. I was starting to get into it and I realized not a single goddamn person looks at it literally in a project i mean i know if it's there you can come in and say look you people aren't paying attention you should have had this on there but i know for this client in particular it's it's pretty simple what i have for them and i just have this via schedules it's not like client dashboards or anything like i have two things inside of here here's the elevations um here's the elevations in 10 decimal inches if it's there here's the work sets they're on and then again here's revit links oh, i thought i had count for them this project was probably before i added that here's levels and grids and it cracks me up, I'll come down here. And I, I go in there, I was like, did nobody see that there's a count of four for this linked model? Somebody's copied the structural model four times. Does nobody even look on here and see that, hey, these are not on the levels and grids work set. Did nobody notice that this is at elevation 1200.0164? What the hell? So I don't know, I was starting getting heavy with some of my clients and a lot of my clients, I just started to realize nobody looks. And maybe it's because I have these in schedule formats. If I had better pie charts up there or something, it would be great. But I just, I think it's cool. I like it. I use these things and that's great if you want to do it. So my answer to that, Michael, is do whatever you as a CAD, as the model manager slash BIM manager want to see. But also is if it gets, there's too much information there, people will stop looking. So choose the one or two things that you deem critical um, versus what you think would be great to have inside of there put the great to have stuff on a different sheet that's not the opening sheet but you know that you might use but if you get too much stuff inside of here people just don't look i don't know what do you guys have melissa yeah ours is very similar 
just the project info and the levels and links and things. Yeah, I've added work sets to mine. I like having the work sets on there. I thought I had count on the Revit links. Um, I might not have done that for this particular client. Um, yeah, I do, I do for grids. <laughs> I, do, I do for grids because like, you know, because you, you can't have two level B. So I don't even know why I have count on there for grids, but not links. Kind of funny. But um, and then the levels, I literally run into one client's project and they weren't using civil elevations even. It was their elevation and not a single one of them were at a point zero. I'm like, oh my God, what did you guys do in this project? But the other reason why I really like the levels is in one project that a new user who got he was putting spot elevations down via the level command. And all of a sudden this project went from like seven levels to like 25 levels. And everyone's like, whoa, I don't know what that's supposed to be, but I noticed this schedule went from this big to this big. And they zoomed in and looked like, oh, okay, we need to kind of come in and get, and get where you're looking at. Yeah, there's an annotation for that. <laughs> yes. And like Beth says, they have a scorecard that gets up there and get a worse score as you get in there. And, and I know I could do that. Most of my clients are using the ID8 tools and ID8 has a literally an out of the thing uh, box thing from ID8 to where you could schedule, especially through ID8 Automate now, schedule it every night to run this tool, it goes into Excel spreadsheet, that Excel spreadsheet is done via sticky right on your thing. And you literally could have the pie charts, everything right on your homepage. And they've got it set up to do that. I just haven't done that with most of my clients because, again, I just feel like nobody looks at this crap anyway, and that's just going to be extra data that I know is there, but nobody else really cares about. So whatever Michael feels like doing, go for it. <laughs> and Tim's like, yeah, same thing. Everybody just shrugs them off. Yeah, it <laughs> seems like they were all the rage, what, just what, pre-COVID? Yeah. All the classes were on how to dashboard things. Yeah. I mean, honest truth, if it were me and the thing I find most critical are the stupid warnings, I would literally, if I was going to do something like that, just have a, a big piece of text next to the project name that says how many warnings and big, bold text. So it's like there. And when you see the preview on the computer, when you're browsing through it, you just see 3,000 warnings, 32 warnings. That That's probably the one for me I would do just to, you know, publicly shame people. <laughs> you could get like sad clipping or something. The sad clippy, a happy clippy. No, just just big bold words. How many warnings you have? Change the color of maybe if it got really bad. So all of a sudden you see a big red blob on your preview. You know it's bad. <laughs> so what else we got? All right. So our last question in Q and A, everybody, is from Tim. Um, asking how title block family reference lines it says or lines I'm thinking maybe or planes behave it seems that locking dimensions breaks the offset from the defined origin bottom right corner in my example in general it seems very sensitive when introducing new constrained dimensions title blocks are extremely sensitive um, <laughs> when you start adding constraints to them I have some constraints in there, but not a lot. I know I had one one client way back when who wanted one title block family, and it was going to all scale based on a 24 by 36, 30 by 42, and it was going to be one title block, and it would do it all. And I'm kind of like, yeah, no, that's just overcomplicating the crap out of it. Um, I do have quite a bit of stuff in mind when I start looking at it, but I am my constraints are basically set up for... Um, not even within the title block itself. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So if I go into my VG and I turn on all my annotative stuff, my dimensions, and I say, okay. So you'll see, I've got a lot of stuff inside of here. Most of these are just equality constraints. Like, hey, I wanted this to be centered and this needed to be centered between that. But I've got four of these that are equal. I do then technically have a value for this reference plane and a dimension for what is that gonna do? Right, so what is the width of this? What is that? I used to have that constrained. I just stopped constraining it um, because again, I was like, cool, that way I can just do a save as, change the width of this for one client, change the width of this. And I started realizing, well, the freaking labels don't move anyway. None of this stuff moves anyway. So I just stopped doing that. So for me, this is my title block, it's here. I just use a crap ton of visibility. So like I wanted these alignment lines, mine are invisible so you can snap to them. I wanted these alignment lines inside of there. I just started adding a whole bunch of visibility parameters. 
because originally I was like, I'll just move them for constraints and then it would break. And I was just spinning way too many wheels to start going inside of this or not. So for me, it was much easier for something like that just to add a whole lot of formula is formulage, formulage to some of this stuff. It's like, oh, if it's the one and a half, it needs to show up at these values. If it's the one on this, it needs to show up at these values. So literally I was just doing a whole lot of and or not type scenarios inside of here to get these to display. But as for width, et cetera, um, the things that I wanted to adjust, like the layout of the boxes, that's a nested family that's controlled that way. So I went through and said, yes, cool. If you want to really start to see, so like if I come in here and change this from a title block, that's probably two columns and two rows to six rows and four columns. Um, I'm not moving any of the lines around. The lines all stayed. I just have a visibility toggle for those lines that come on. And at this point in time, I have none if it's that many. Um, but for all the standard size, oops, I wanted to off. All the standard sizes coming inside of her, you can see that, hey, this is actually just changing the width, et cetera. So for me, yeah, I didn't get too over the top. You can, but I forget Tim asked the questions. You start getting too much on this, I guarantee you, it's just going to start breaking. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, it's going to be like, oh, I was moving from the origin point, but now all of a sudden, I'm going to decide to move from the right hand side. And I'm like, what? Why? And it doesn't matter if you pin this. I'm like, yeah, pin it and lock it. It'll stay new. No, it doesn't care. So that's all I've got. Yeah, what you're what you're seeing, Tim, is not uncommon for the Revit world. Yeah, it's mostly our alignment lines that have. Yeah, and Beth's saying, yeah, I, I started really nesting advanced. generic annotations into it to get everything to stay. Yeah, that's the same thing I've done here with these um little orange lines here. And then again, for me, I wanted the layout lines in the project, so in the project I can align and lock or align and snap my views to those, but those are just a whole lot of visibility toggles. So hopefully that answers your question, Tim. Uh, no, Tim, well, there's was... no with I'm readjusting. That's what we love to do in Revit, is readjusting yeah. all the time. The other thing I did find, oh, I shouldn't have closed that. The other thing that I actually did find um, that was really bizarre to me is because I, I have my base title block that I start for um, all my clients. Um, and the one thing that cracked me up about my title block that I had found is if I go in and start trying to make adjustments, if there's a dimension on it, even though the dimension isn't padlocked, it will start moving shit around. Um, so really bizarre, and I don't know if it's just my title block, I because I, I create my title blocks all from this and all my clients, but it's like, you're like, oh, cool, I want to go ahead and delete this line so these dimensions change. There's no, but what the fuck, I just deleted a line. Why did this jump up to six inches, right? This should be, I'm deleting this line, so this should be two and three quarters of an inch. If I delete the line, it took the line it was dimensioned and moved it. I get this all the flipping time, but if I delete the dimension string, and then delete this line, this line stays put. There's something very bizarre that if you have dimensions in there, even though you might not be moving something or you'll move one down here, nothing's constrained. All of a sudden, this one up here starts moving too. So I do have to quite often like, oh, cool, I'm tweaking this for a client. I just literally just delete. And you can see nothing's padlocked. Nothing weird is going on here. There's no constraints on this. But if I delete one of these lines, oftentimes the other lines start, oh, I deleted one line, the whole damn thing went away. I just, I haven't figured out what the hell it's doing. But if I delete the engine, it doesn't do it. That's so fun for you. Yes, That's so fun. I've never seen that one. <laughs> well, the worst part was the first time I did it, I like deleted a line down here and playing and all of a sudden my title block was no longer like 34, or whatever size I was doing, 30 inches. It was something like 39 inches. I'm like, where did it come from? Because it was like just moving stuff all around. Is a fun feature. Um, Gatlin actually said my previous point uh, I, I talked about actually this is something Desiree came up with at a previous firm um, for the insertion point. I think um, Parallax does the same thing. My thought pro or Der Desiree's thought process was actually the insertion point not be the top corner, but right here, because yeah. when you've got a set of detail sheets that are all laid out, if you have this is the insertion point, regardless of if the title block goes grows to the right or to the left or whatever all of this stuff is gonna come inside of here. So having this as the insertion point, you can tweak your detail sizes to be the same for 30 by 42 or uh, uh, 36 by 48, just by simply 
tweaking this by like an eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch and having the board over here be slightly different. But those detail guides boxes could be all the same size regardless. You just add one more row for the 36 as opposed that you had for the 30. And that was something Desiree came up when she was creating a title block for that the last firm she worked for. I'm like, oh, that's brilliant. Now you're not rearranging th everything every time you do it. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly how we do it. Um, we did move it for one client because they tended to have more of their general notes and things in the bottom right, whereas we usually put them up at that top top right. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah, top right so usually because all the notes are stuff is usually up there. Yeah. So. yeah, usually you've got all your general notes starting here, not down here. So yeah, no, I, th I thought it was brilliant. When I asked Melissa, she's like, yeah, we've always done that one. Like, or I might even ask Eric, he's like, I've always done that one. Like, Damn you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I, no, the, I don't think I'd thought about it until working with her. Yeah, I just always like, done oh, it's AutoCAD. That's... We did it the lower left in AutoCAD, but where I put it, yep. for Autodesk had it, who cares? Yeah, no, never thought about it, really. Um, the one thing I will say, too, and PyRevit does have this utility. Um, one of the tools I love in PyRevit is in the boo-boo-boo edit button here. No, I didn't want to switch. I want to go back to that block. I did not click there. So in the edit in PyRevit, one of the things I completely love is they have place origin marker. And it literally just draws two detail lines or annotative lines, depending on the type of view you are, where the origin is for that view. If it's in a project, if it's a 3D view, it'll place it in a 3D view. But if you're in a drafting view in your project, it'll show you there. Or even if you're in a sheet in a project, it will put it at the origin. So I do love this. So that's why I'm saying that's where your insertion point is. You might know where, not know where it is, what's going on with that, but that is your insertion point. Um, and part of the reason why I say is that one client, somebody just came in and drew it and they're like, you know, their title block was like way the hell over here. So you'd go to place a title, a new title block manually. You're like, why is it coming in so flipping far up here? The other thing is I had one client and um, I had one client who came in and they're like, we hate Revit. You can't copy something from one title block and paste it into another title block. It comes in in a different location. I'm like, yeah, you just have to paste the line current view. Like, no, it doesn't work. I went into their project, started placing origin markers in every single one of the sheets. Not a single sheet had the same origin. For some reason, somebody must have went and deleted the title block and manually just drug title blocks onto the already created sheets. But you obviously have no idea where you're snapping those. So I placed an origin marker everywhere, moved everything in each sheet that they had in their template back to zero, zero. I'm like, now look, you can copy and paste. I'm like, oh my God. And then I do the same thing even like in a project for Legends. So if I'm back in a project and I go over to the legends, I want to make sure I'm drawing all my legends from the same location, et cetera. Um, so if you even come into like this client, I'm sure at the bottom they have a legend template. Yeah, here's a note template for legends. Um, and if I hide this generic annotation, yeah, it's showing you here's the insertion point at the end of this. So this is where you start drawing it. And again, if I go to the PyRevit and I say place origin marker, it's going to be that upper right corner right there. So I went through and made sure all of the general notes, everything in any legend is using the same insertion point. So if you swap one general note out for another, it doesn't move on the damn sheet. So big deal for me is that um, PyRevit using that tool works really well. Cool. Oh, looks like we got another question that came up. On the origin, so um, Tim asked follow up, where is that origin based on? It's based on the origin of the view. If you're in a 3D view, it's based on the origin of the project. I don't know if you had this prior to being able to the floor plan to be able to like say, hey, I want to see the Revit origin point, right? We can actually see that now with the XY grid. Prior to that and prior to um, Pi Revit, I had a DWG that had a line drawn from zero, zero. And I always insert link Revit or link CAD, put it in there. Cool, that's where it is. And in a project, I would just now know where it was, draw something there, and then remove the link. But in like a family, I couldn't use, I don't want to insert because you can't link it. So I'd, I'd insert, I'd do dimensions, and I'd undo, 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 undo the, the importing of a CAD file. And then I'd move the shit over and then import the CAD file again. Yes, I moved it right. And then undo again. Now with Pi Revit Place Origin Marker, it's like, oh my God. So it works really, really well. Um, what's the dashed yellow line? 
been asked. I don't know where you, where was I when you said, where's the dashed yellow line? Oh, and here, this is just a reference plane. So in my legends, I have a reference plane because you can use that to snap it onto a sheet. So if I um, open up a sheet and I'm like, cool, I wanted that general node up here, whatever it is, well, I probably have one inside of here. You can see I've got the reference planes behind that generic annotation. You can simply use the move command, snap to datum objects. Datum objects are gonna be reference planes, levels, or grids. And then I can be cool, snap to the endpoint there. And now I know I put that in the exact location of where I want it to be. So, yep, that's what that line was. It's just a, hey, you can snap to this datum object. Only works in really legends that, uh, in legends can't, and, and detailed views. You obviously can't do that for project views, you know, model views, because you're like, oh, I'm going to draw reference planes all over the place. Yeah, grids all over the place. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm going to say... They did top they left top corner. Left. They're a benefit to top right. Yeah, which I think you covered. Doesn't matter. The only thing is, like I said, you've got all your sheets laid out. If you switch this from a 36 by 42 title block to a 30 by 42, if that's your insertion point, none of this stuff is all going to move. I mean, if you had something way down here, but that's part of the title block. But if you had something way down here, then cool. So, yeah, that's the only theory. Yeah, just whatever's going to make it easier when everything changes. And let's see. Okay, we've got one from Philip saying, what is your opinion with 3D families, say casework that has many conditional statements embedded? Does it slow down the model when you have a large number of these families placed? For context, I know families with array can slow down the model if there are a lot of them. I, I don't think it slows the model down. I mean, if you have a lot of complex formulas in there, the only time Revit is accessing those complex formulas is when you're manipulating a value where it needs to look on that, that complex formula. So if I'm in there working and it's like, cool, um, I'm just placing the families, I do not notice my families go any slower or the project goes slower because I have a family with complex formulas. In. Now, when I go to edit that family, like I have a ton of families for louvers, right? I've got louvers and doors and windows and curtain panels, and there's hundreds of louvers in some of these. When I place it or swap it out, it's just all the same as swapping out a regular curtain panel or placing a door or window, whatever. None of that changes, but it's like, oh, cool. I need to change the louver spacing from half of an inch to three quarters. I type that value in, then yes, my Revit is going to pause and think about it because, gee, I've got to change that on 75 families and there's math involved in doing that. But for having that within my fa my families themselves, I do not notice a slowdown in the project only when making a change to that. Now, if it's an instance-based property and you've got like a line-based family and you're like, I'm clicking from here to here to place this arrayed countertop support and it starts getting overly complicated, then yes, that possibly can be there. That's why for me and a lot of my families, I have a quantity version. Just give me two, that's, autumn, that's the default. But then I can untick that and say, hey, let me do a spacing version so I get six spaced. Because if I'm only saying always give me two, it's not recalculating any of the math or trying to repopulate how many goes in there. It's saying, hey, I'm just giving you two. I'm not trying to think about, oh, when you draw this, I got to keep adding one every six inches. So I have that as well. My example of that, um, probably not in here. What is this project? Is this something actually? Is this a nothing project? I don't want to break that actual project. Yeah, so this is my project here. So if I were to go load my family for this, do, 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 do. let's go into here. Let's load my casework family. So what I can think of off the top of my head. Middle work counter support array. So if I go place that component, uh, work plane. For all this, I'll show you what I mean. So if I look at this here, I've got right now a value of, hey, it's just gonna be four. So no matter how long I draw this, it's just giving me four. But oftentimes under the type properties, then I have one where I can untick it and say, cool, now it's gonna allow me as, I'm, as it's drawing to be two feet apart, four feet apart, whatever it is. 
So I will oftentimes give myself toggles like that. And I know, granted, the average user doesn't know this, but I grab the one that's just going to have the quantity as I'm drawing it across. And then I swap it out to be the one that's not just the quality, where I can then come in and say, cool, now space it every two feet, three feet, whatever it's going to be. So that's kind of my answer to that. Because yes, I have had some families where it's like, oh, I got to repeat this every quarter of an inch. And as you try to change the size, it's like really dragging it down. Because at that point in time, it's calculating. So for me, the other tip is try not to make that inaccessible or again, make a toggle to turn it on or off. But I, I don't think I have any families that don't have a conditional statement in them. So if that was to slow your projects down, all of my projects would be really slow. Yeah, we, we definitely have a lot of conditional statements in ours too and we oh, we find it usually the imported CAD crap that is what really yes. kills families and kills projects yeah that, that's the most often so yeah that, that's I mean I've not actually run a study of oh if I had a project that all of these families that had no conditional formulas in them versus a project that had these in there but the amount of speed I'm gaining on placing and manipulating them would more than overcome trying to manually tweak and edit things without having those formulas. I mean, you saw my title block. I mean, I had conditional statements on all of those just lines to snap to. And those, you know, I have clients who use that same title block and they have, you know, 3000 pages in the Revit file and it's not changing anything. Now, if I do a select all instances and I want to swap this from that, then sure, it takes a little bit longer because again, I am currently editing that family. Oh, another question popped up. Yep. So we've got a question from Juliana. Is there an easy way or tool that is not Dynamo to divide walls by levels? I know how to batch do it for structural columns. I don't, not that, I mean, you can split by a level, but I don't think, I don't even know how to batch do it by structural columns. Do, 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 do. I'm trying to think for walls, is there what? I can't think of anything. Of course, this project probably has no levels in it. Um, I was trying to think if there was something for walls. Maybe you got the split tool, but the split tool doesn't even give you like the great option of, hey, I want to split this by levels, et cetera. So not to my knowledge, Juliana. Um, well, if you're in an elevation, you can. Well, yeah, if you're in an elevation, yeah. you do it. But you probably have no elevations or anything in the spot. <laughs> Third party tools. Um, I would also think that if there was an automated way, that would also be, you'd have to be very careful. Granted, I know Juliana is a structural because, you know, you go back to like this file over here, you start looking at all those crazy levels I have for, oh, there's two levels, six inches apart over here. There's this, there's that. You start looking at all that stuff. You said split by level. All of a sudden you're going to start getting six inch tall walls. Um, so, I mean, I see tons of levels created where I personally don't think they need to be levels. So I don't even know if I would want that automated tool. Unless you really say split these and I want to check this, there's this, there's this. Yeah, and Tim's saying no. There's some Python or third-party apps that'll let you do it. But you can do it when exporting naps works. Export to naps works. You can say split levels and columns but or split columns and walls by level. But I don't think you can do it natively in Revit. Yeah, I've only ever had to do one or two at a time. So. Oh, look at that. We're at the top of the hour. And no questions. That was like perfect. I just can't believe it. I didn't go over today. So I thank everybody for joining us on Rep Radio. I did record this. I will get this up on my YouTube site so you can share it to all your frenemies, coworkers who you want to put to sleep, um, who are bothering you too much, and then you know, just want to put them to sleep, have them listen to me for an hour. Um, with that said. Um, I appreciate everybody for showing. Hopefully you'll be here next month and we should see you by then. Thank you.